God, introduce yourself for me. I'm Donald Bakir. I'm 77 years old. I reside in Inglewood, California, in the shadow of the Soul Fi Stadium. For the dime moves in the lows, for the six foes on spokes, for the OGs that did a dime, came back around on parole, for the homegirls with the scrap game, little homies that gang bang, from Pelican Bay to YA, rearrange your mind frame. Yeah, I know what you've been through. Shit, you had to go tend to. Your mama gave birth on the turf. I know them killers you kin to. This for the lost generation, broke his hell, man. I was lifting weights and I was on swore. They start calling me Big Miz. Original Stutterbox. Eastside Five, who's Pablo Bishop, Man City Gangsta Bloods. Yeah, Mac, video, video, you know. I um, have eight kids, I can't say kids, eight uh, offspring <laughs> uh, who live within, pretty much within uh, a mile of me in Inglewood. Um, I was born in Kansas City, Missouri in 1944. I um, actually talked to people who had been slaves, unbeknownst to me, of course, I was five, six years old, but I have known slaves, uh, watched them attempt to write their ex and seen their ex exuberance, their, their delight in completing it. Uh, I, <laughs> I'm an activist. I've been an activist since um, I was at Howard University in 1962, <laughs> um, involved in SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, but um, after after which I was. Um, I was uh, uh, kicked out of school unceremoniously uh, for being totally indifferent to <laughs> the curriculum, uh, but um, much involved with the, the new civil rights movement, you know. Uh, I, I um, slipped up, dropped to class, fell below, lost my um, uh, my status, my draft status, and got drafted into the Vietnam War, 1966. Give, give us a picture of, of, of Kansas City growing up. Kansas City was a um, progressive racially. Um, Kansas City was um, Harry Truman. You know, uh, uh, it was corrupt, but which we took it for granted. Uh, but um, it it was nurturing. You know, um, for me, it was not. There were no gangs. Or, I was the. Um, <laughs> I was the cub reporter for the Kansas City Call newspaper, uh, Southwest leading weekly black newspaper. Um, I had covered football games. By the time I was 15, I had covered uh, the University of Missouri and Kansas University and Gale Sayers and interviewed people like um, brother that wanted decathlon. But for C.K. Young and for Rafer Johnson, it would be the toughest and most important journey of their lives. Now you want to decathlon, Rafer Johnson. I, but, you know, we all, uh, Rafer recently passed. Uh, but I mean at 15. So uh, I was, 
a bowler and a, with a much fervor and, little, and not much skill. But, uh, uh, 1944, so that means you grew up in the Jim Crow era. Yeah. So explain, yeah. explain Jim Crow era in Kansas City. Jim Crow era in, in Kansas City, man. We went downtown with my mother to eat lunch at one of the uh, uh, counters. And we were, took for granted that we were going to wait for our, our meals at the side, even if there were the, the uh, stools were not occupied, <laughs> we had to wait at the, at the end of the uh, bar, you know. Certain places you had to, you know, you weren't comfortable at. You, know, you, you got called, if you got caught off in the wrong neighborhood, uh, you got called nigger and, and, and threatened you know, by uh, uh, white boys in, in, in sedans, you know, wilding. Uh, what what did moms and pops do for a living in Kansas City back then? My dad was my hero. My dad, he um, was um, the head pressman for the Kansas City Call newspaper. He had about eight people on his crew, and they put out about twenty thousand newspapers a week. And it was uh, a very strong po politic that uh, ushered in the new uh, uh, black uh, political power that came out of uh, Kansas City and cities like that, you know, St. Louis, Chicago. When we turned on, 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 on uh, uh, segregation and uh, white supremacy, you know. Um, there were there were conflicts, you know, but white people changed. It was it was it was a phenomenal to <laughs> me. They, they changed. They, it's like we thought that it would always be. Um, Blacks were uh, never going to make as much as, as white people would make, you know, uh, uh, that we would always have uh, poor commentations, uh, that most black people would be poor. I mean, black people, when they came out of slavery, their literacy level was almost nothing. It was, it was like when they did the, the, the census and they said, can you read and write? Black people didn't start checking those off that they could until 1900, you know, 40, 50 years after slavery. And it's been a struggle for them to get to 75% where they are now. How, how far can you trace your family back? You know, your roots, your grandparents and beyond? Well, I know, I know back to about 1830s when uh, um, I can trace some of my, my uh, relatives back to Virginia. Uh, and then I can trace, um, you know, I've done the, the uh, DNA, so I know that a lot of me is Nigerian. Mm -hmm. I got a poem about all this. Uh, my nose is Nigerian. And um, I know. Spartan is from Timbuktu, mine, you know, um, so that, you know, that's about as far as I've gone. My sister is constantly coming up with new. <laughs> yeah. I, I've traced, I've traced my uh, great, great grandparents to 1820. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, Hawkinsville, Georgia. Yeah. yeah. So let, let's, let's move it forward. When you were in high school, was it a segregated high school you went to back then, or was it integrated? It's, it's an anomaly. People don't understand this because 30% of uh, kids that graduate from uh, Los, uh, school in L.A., L.A. Unified School District, which I taught 30 years in, they
I want to know about your high school experience in Kansas City. Was it, was it, was it segregated? I never had a white teacher. I, had, I came out among the finest high schools and still today, well, it's Lincoln Academy. I never had a white teacher from kindergarten through 12th grade. And when I left 12th grade, I went to Howard University and I never had a white teacher at home. Your, your, your son uh, mentioned that you, you, en you enrolled in the uh, armed forces. I got drafted, man. I got kidnapped. <laughs> <laughs> this is before Howard University, during or after? Right after. Yeah. So you was a college graduate? No, I didn't graduate. I, that's, that's the reason I got drafted, because I dropped, uh, I stopped going full time. And I uh, got drafted, you know. It was like, but they were drafting everybody. And it was like, you know, it was some scandalous stuff. But I was kind of, I, I, I have to admit, I was kind of curious. You know, there's a curiosity that goes with being 19 in that age group, I was curious, could I kill a man? You know, I was, I really, I didn't know if I could. And I thought I might have to at some point. I began to think that. Uh, and I knew the Army. I'd been in ROTC in high school. We, had, we shot rifles in high school. At school, uh, I'd been in ROTC at uh, Howard University. You know, we had weapons. And I was curious. Some, not all of me. You know, it wasn't like I was glad I got drafted, but I wasn't scared of uh, dying. What year did you get drafted? 1966. Well, I got drafted. I got noticed in '65. You know. I, I reported in January 1966, and I served in November 1967. And I went to Vietnam for, in January 1967. And I, uh, what was your ranking? <laughs> when you come in the, the, in the service, they give you a test. It's like an IQ test. It's called a GT test. And um, I scored 140, which is like an IQ of 140. Um, but everybody comes into the service as an E1, private, you know, uh, same status, you know. So um, I got one promotion in basic training, and then I got uh, another promotion when I went to Officers Candidate School. Um, when I refused the commission, I refused the commission. I went through the whole program, and I refused the commission because all of a sudden they slapped me in the face and told me, you are still a nigger. You can have all this uh, uh, fancy uh, uniforms and uh, uh, slick talk, but when it comes down to it, we don't have to be fair. <laughs> when you, <laughs> we say, when to, you say you didn't commission, I, I, what does that mean? A commission is, in the Army, you got... Um, People who are, are uh, non-commissioned officers, like sergeants, corporals, and you got commissioned officers, their bosses, lieutenants, colonels, majors, generals, like that. Um, I was, you have to qualify to go from non-commissioned to commissioned. So I was supposed to sign up for another extra year while I trained to be a commission officer, where I'd make a lot more money, and I'd be, you know, they would tell a whole lot more people what to do. Probably be a lot safer. Um, 
But because in those days it was all about race. You know, it was like I, people were not that glad to see me successful in the, in the, um, the training, what they call it OCS, Officers Candidate School. So when you got drafted, did you actually make it to Vietnam and see war? Yeah, yeah. After I got kicked out of Officers Candidate School, or oh, I quit, really, um, they sent me, do not pass, go, do not collect $200, go straight to Vietnam. But I had been trained as a 50 caliber machine gunner and a, um, uh, scout, um, so it's meant pretty much, you know, very high risk, you know, I was pretty good at it though, so I wasn't really scared. That so you was on the front line? And not when I was no 140 IQ, bro. No, I had too many ways. I wasn't even scared. I knew, I I knew new administration so well. When I got to the place before they decide, these are the people who give me to go out to the field, and these are the people that's gonna go over here and help with what we need in the base. I was on a typewriter, and I, I was typing like in those days. This this is not the electric typewriter. This is the manual typewriter. I was slamming and slamming that. Uh, 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 carriage, they called it. Boom, boom, boom. And they looked up and they said, what the hell is going on? It's a phenomenon. So I became the company clerk, you know, which is, you know, good in some ways. A lot better for staying alive. Do you remember where on the map they, they, they put you at in Vietnam? Yeah, I was in Play Cool. I was in Play Cool, Central Highlands, when, when I wasn't AWOL, when I wasn't in 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 not uh, not train or somewhere where I don't run off. <laughs> so what year did you make it back to civilization? To the world to the real world, the real 1960, world. 1967. But I'd made a whole lot of promises to a whole lot of whole lot of brothers, you know, that uh, we're gonna change stuff when we get back. When we got back, we're gonna get with Stokely, we're gonna get with Black Panthers, <laughs> we're going to change this stuff. Uh, Where did you land at in, in 67 when you came back? Uh, Kansas City. No, I had to go to a little college town right outside of Kansas City. It was uh, Central Missouri State uh, in Independence, Missouri. The home, in fact, I think I saw Harry Truman walking down the street free as a bird. Um, yeah, I went there. So you didn't go back to Howard and finish? No, I got caught up. I was, uh, I had to get a B average. I, had, I sneaked out of Vietnam and I had to get a B average to not get pulled back. So I was going to this little cracker <laughs> college. What was that? I mean, the voice was actually cracked. You know, and uh, I had to go there and be successful and penetrate their their uh, their lines and get what I needed to get and get out of there. Uh, so um, then I did. When I, then I went to the main campus, which was was uh, Warrensburg, Missouri. Warrensburg was a, was backwards. Oh, I was there one, maybe two days. And I'm living in a dormitory, right? I'm coming back from Vietnam. I'm about 21, 22. You know, I'm, I got all the bad habits on the planet, on the planet Earth, you know. But I had known Stokely. I'd been close to Stokely. And I was a leader, you know. I had been trained. I had been trained more, more than most, most anybody, you know. And, um, uh, kids were drawn to me. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna come back to that. Something popped in my head when you said you came back from Vietnam with the bad habits. Yeah. And, and, and I'm thinking, they said a lot of the Americans went out there and got hooked on heroin and the whole Frank Lucas sending heroin back from Vietnam to America. Did you witness anything like that? Man, no. 
Mm -mm. I heard a lot about were, were American like troops that. getting hooked on heroin out there? Oh well, look, what happened was this. You know, uh, in contrast to what the media says, I was actually there. Um, you could get heroin. You know, you could get that black tar, uh, and then sometimes. Mostly it was like opium, liquid opium, that they would put on the, the weed, but it was really all about the weed. The, you got Kent, a pack of Kent cigarettes uh, with the filters would be filled up with weed. That, that was what they standard, $20. Um, but um, the Viet Cong, uh, not the Viet Cong, the North Vietnamese, realized that um, they could, they could um, sabotage the war by making opium uh, available, by making heroin available, by making, you know, um, that was that was just another weapon. You know, some people, some people didn't didn't look around for landmines when they went off on uh, in the woods. You know, some people, you took certain risks. You know. Uh, yeah, it was a lot of any most a lot of the medics were hung up on that. Uh, um, I almost said the drug they give you when you when you you in hospice you get ready to die. To that? kill the pain. Oh, what's the name of that? When they give you that shot. Yeah, morphine. Morphine. They were all hooked on morphine, right? So they would re up so they could get that morphine. You know. Um, People were doing what they could to get by. I remember it was, man, it was, you know, it was calm most of the time. The water is hardly rippled on lazy, but ominous oriental lakes as we cleaned our weapons in wild time. <laughs> Friendships faded with war removals and overstuffed and frightened brains brought there from Brooklyn Bronx and Watts. Hastily, heat heavy. This is a memoir, autobiography, or whatever. It's about my PTSD um, experience. A lot of it is, um, well, initially came from my Vietnam experience. I, I don't know. After I came back from Vietnam, I got a lot of good stuff from it. You know, I became a leader. I knew what a leader was. I knew I was not reckless. You know, uh, I was. I knew I was a survivor. You know, but uh, I was humiliated. I'd been cussed, called nigger by officers. Um, experimented on. Uh, and, Degraded to the point where you know now alcohol was not you, you know in Vietnam a mug of beer cost a nickel a nickel they wanted you to stay drunk to be able to do this horrible stuff they wanted you to do you know they wanted you to kill eight million people not eight million soldiers eight million people and tell you you were saving their lives and you were better for them, they were better off now. So I I latched on to, to the, the movement, you know. I was like, I had to be balanced. I knew I had to do something to um, balance out all this stuff I'd done. So, you know, I got involved in the movement. But when I came to LA, what, what, what pulled you to L.A. in what year? My, my parents moved to L.A. My mother and my father moved here in 1969. So I moved, I moved here with my wife, Sharon. Where did your parents land at? When, where did they first live when they came to Los Angeles in 1969? They lived in the jungles. But the jungles were different then. The jungles were like... For, for us, when there was a, bunch, a lot of people coming from Kansas City out to L.A. then, uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, 
it was um, well taken care of, you know, a lot of beautiful shrubbery. Uh, most, of the, most of the apartments, you, were, you couldn't have just kids. It was no graffiti. I used to walk through the, um, through the alleys in the jungle at 3, 4 o'clock in the morning going to catch the bus up on Adams and uh, go to my job at night out at the uh, USC hospital, County USC. Uh, the, it was a serene time <laughs> in L.A. I was like, uh, we thought of uh, L.A. as a big old country town because <laughs> it was not, it was not that threat, you know, it didn't, I, I wasn't filled with, you know, the fat seconds <laughs> that uh, when you feel like uh, you're in a situation. Um, Where did you land at? I, well, I stayed with them for a, a minute, not, maybe not a, a month or so. Then, then we moved to, um, we moved right behind the, the bookstore. There was a famous bookstore called the Aquarian Bookstore on uh, Raymond and uh, what was called Santa Barbara in those days, but now it's King Boulevard. Um, I stayed like a block away from the bookstore because I was fascinated with it. It was the best black bookstore in the country. It was almost 50 years old, Aquarian Bookstore. So I stayed in that block. While I was at FOI, though, see, I, I got to sell 100 papers a week. You know, I got to sell 40 pounds of fish a week. You, you, know, you joined the, the NLI in L.A. or? In L.A. I tried. I put in my letter. That was the process in those days. You had to write a letter to Elijah Muhammad and pretty much swear your uh, allegiance to him. Um, what, what made you go that route? Who pulled you into that? Well, I had a bookstore over on... Um, the Crenshaw Strip, across the street from Maverick's flat, at the end of the uh, uh, car wash. Mm -hmm. Jomo's, black books by black artists and black publishers only. Um, and I sold revolutionary stock. I was looking for the revolution, you know. And I, on the corner was, uh, was the US organization, uh, Ron Karinga, Brother Rod. And uh, he moved in the block right after me, and it was, it, the block was live. Um, but I knew from being in the Army that um, my security was compromised, you know, that uh, I was wilding, you know. Um, I mean, I was the president of the Black Student Union back in, in Missouri. I started a riot. You know, I, I, I had a confrontation with the chair out in front of my, um, my dorm. I kicked a big, uh, a big dent in the side of his, his, his vehicle because he almost ran me down. I was like, um, people were telling me my phone was tapped. You know, I knew it probably was. But the only thing was, I was clean. I didn't have any uh, warrants, you know. I was an, I was, and plus, I was a patriot. All of all of the the men in those days, most men were ashamed, like our president, to admit that they didn't have the guts to go to Vietnam. So they didn't they they didn't give me much problem because they knew I was more American than them. <laughs> so I, I was I'm, more American than them. I'm thinking about the time that you and your family moved to L.A., 1969-ish. My, my, my wife and I, we didn't have a family. All right, this, this is right around the time that, that, that Bunchy Carter gets killed at the UCLA campus, right? So you're, you're, you're landing in L.A. During, during a turbulent time. You want to describe what, what was going on? The people were trying to pull you to the Panthers or pull you to us. People had life and their blood feuds going on, you know. It, uh, the uh, Cointel Pro had managed to flip. 
You didn't manage to flip the whole uh, uh, movement. Everybody was paranoid. You know, everybody was going to prison, breaking down. You know, uh, it, it it became real immoral. You know, freakish. Um, it wasn't about having babies. You know, it was uh, you died. It was dying on the vine. I um, but I mean, you know, we didn't we miss misjudge a lot of people. I didn't because I had seen fifty caliber machine guns. I sat on the back of them and seen what they could do. Sitting reminiscent